this week on The Futurists. You know, the mRNA vaccines were, it wasn't just Moderna, it was BioNTech and others that had been working on this for years. This was just a, an application that really had the urgency to, to really push it through into our, you know, the marketplace in our arms very quickly. But, you know, the real breakthrough there is that we went from manufacturing a vaccine in eggs or in, in, in the lab. Now your body becomes the manufacturing plant, so to speak. We're really just putting in the program, you know, to make spike protein, COVID spike protein in your body. Your body manufactures it and ultimately produces the immune reaction to it, which is how you get your, your immunological defense. Welcome to The Futurists. I'm Brett King, and with my co-host, Robert Turchek, we delve into the future of humanity, the future of technology, and uh, everything in between. Today, we're going to dive into biology and what it means in terms of forecasting how we think about that in the future. Well, this week, we've got somebody on our show that I'm very thrilled to include, a longtime friend of mine and someone who inspires me personally because of his passion to his particular domain in the future. Our guest this week is the biohacker and synthetic biology leader, Andrew Hassel. Andrew, welcome to the show. Great to have you on The Futurists. Great to see you, Rob. How have you been? I haven't talked to you in a while. a cool term too, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Biohacker. I'm not. Uh, most people don't call me a biohacker, but I am definitely a hacker at heart. Um, if futurist wasn't cool enough, then you got biohacker in there as well. <laughs> well, it's you know, just, it really goes to one of the themes here, which is that we're not just about people who are talking about the future. We're interested in the people who are creating the future and inventing the future and making the future. And that's certainly something that Andrew's been doing for for as long as I've known, which is more than ten years. You know, when I first met you, you were going around the country talking to high school students and teaching them how to do synthetic biology in their classrooms, which blew my mind. That was a real passion project for you at the time. Yeah, it still is. I think uh, like computing, synthetic biology is really an emerging uh, is a field that's led by young people, you know, the, that just are coming in with a completely different perspective or highly digital and just open to learning. And at the time, you mentioned that it was important to get this information into the public domain, you know, where it could be used by everybody as opposed to dominated by a handful of big, you know, say, pharma or chemical companies. What's your perspective on that today? Well, biology is open source in the sense that all the code of biology, uh, which is written in DNA, is uh, it's an executable code, but it's completely open. You can take any organism and get the code uh, in a very straightforward way. Um, and we all run the same code. So uh, for me, I just felt it was very important that that code remains as, as open and transparent as possible, because if it came under proprietary control, I have no idea what that would mean for the, you know, for life on this planet. You're using the term code and kind of an analogy, um, I think, where, where I think it's important for our audience to understand that when you're referring to code, you're not talking about the ones and zeros of digital software that define our digital universe. You're actually talking about the software that runs our biology, our, you know, our humanity uh, and the natural world. In other words, the, um, the, the DNA code. The DNA code, but the DNA code is digital. It's just not, it's base four instead of base two. So it's written in, in molecular bits uh, represented by the letters A, T, G, and C, but it's a digital code. So when I say coding an organism or DNA code, I'm really talking about a programming language. And you believe that we can program biology the same way that we program a computer? Uh, very similar, actually. The, the you you can think of the processors as being different uh, with digital code. It's it's an electronic processor. With uh, with biological code, it's a cellular processor that's actually that's processing molecules. But the concepts actually are very similar. And just a level set for the audience here, by way of introduction, we should talk a little bit about your uh, the things you're doing, the things you've accomplished, and and your book. Uh, congratulations, you've written a book. I know I that's did. been a long time. I <laughs> yeah, did. There it is. The Genesis, the Genesis Machine. Machine. Yeah, fabulous. So the Genesis Machine, uh, written by Andrew Hessel and co-authored or co-written with Amy Webb, who is also a notable futurist and probably a really fun person to write a book like that with. Yeah. So congrats on that. That's a big deal. Thank you. It was you want to talk about that? Do you want to talk about that process, Andrew, how the book came about? 
Yeah. So, you know, uh, of course, in the last couple of years, we've uh, all been through this wonderful pandemic. Uh, most of what I'd been doing um, was really moving a startup company I had uh, it, to New York. Um, when everything got shut down in 2020, I was just uh, I was just focusing on homeschool and home enter- and home improvement. Uh, and I got a phone call out of the blue from from uh, my speaker's agent who who connected me with Amy and Amy had a book uh, deal already in place for looking at CRISPR gene editing technology. And she come to realize, no, this is bigger than just gene editing. It's really about programming life. Uh, so we connected and, and started writing the book. Cool. Tell us about the connection between CRISPR and synthetic biology and maybe start with the definition of the two things. Well, CRISPR is a gene editing technology. Essentially, it's a tool. It's actually part of an ancient microbial immune system, but it's a tool that allows us to precisely cut the DNA molecule in a specific place and to do manipulations there, either leave a deletion or add some new code. So it's a G, it's basically a cut and paste technology for the DNA molecule. With synthetic biology, most of that editing process is moved into computer software. We move code blocks around using software tools. And when we're finished, we hit print and synthesize a new DNA molecule. So, so it just, I, I am a giant fan of synthetic biology because it makes genetic engineering something you can do with a laptop rather than a lab. So biology is moving from like a wet science with beakers and pet test tubes and people in lab jackets towards an information science or computational science. Yes. It, it makes, it makes genetic engineering almost identical to software engineering, except you're programming a very different process with the cell. Obviously, the the technology for being able to sequence genes has uh, advanced in parallel with computing. Um, but um, what would you say, from a from a computing perspective or a, a scientific understanding perspective, apart from uh, um, you know gene editing technologies like CRISPR, what are the biggest milestones we've had in synthetic biology? Well, let me just back up a little bit because you you just Please. introduced a, a new term, sequencing. Sequencing is is really a, a, a translation process where we go from the chemical bits of information in the DNA molecule and read out those chemical bits and convert them into electronic bits that we can manipulate on a computer. That's that's really fundamental because you know DNA is a programming language and there's like any language, reading and writing and comprehension. So reading really got an early start. The Human Genome Project and really advanced the technology and made it very accessible. Um, the the problem is when you start to try and edit uh, and write re- edit or write code. With our earlier generation of tools, the editing and writing process were all lab-based and very manual. And so the idea of recombinant DNA or gene splicing technology was really like splicing film. You had to work with the physical material. You had to do cuts, except with the DNA molecule, you're actually doing cuts with enzymatic scissors and enzymatic glue. And you can write anything you want, kind of ransom note style, but it's really hard and it takes a lot of time. And and you have to do other experiments just to confirm the edits that you made actually worked. When you start moving into the electronic world of synthetic biology, all of that again is digitized. It's done on computer, just like we edit film and other materials today electronically. And then you just print out a new DNA molecule that's perfect on the way out. So it, it just makes it more accessible, faster, much more precise. What are the breakthroughs with SynBio? Well, it's everything that you're seeing in the genetic engineering world, except that now it's done with better tools. So it's new enzymes being developed. It's new medicines. Most recently, the mRNA vaccines for COVID, those are built with synthetic biology, but it's also new food stuffs. It's new, it's new industrial materials uh, like, like silk, et cetera. So it's a very large application space opening up because the tools are becoming easier to use. Let's talk a little bit about the mRNA vi- uh, vaccines because um, that was obviously a gigantic win for humanity because the vaccine was developed in about a quarter of the time that it would typically take to develop a vaccine. And we were able to scale it up very fast. So that was great uh, during the pandemic. But what I think a lot of people don't realize is that Moderna had been working on that particular technique for nearly a decade before that. Uh, And so synthetic biology has been kind of like a 
a long dawn. Uh, it's taken quite some time for it to reach a level of maturation where these processes can be industrialized and scaled up. Yeah, you know, it's actually in its third decade now. So as a as a tool set, so it's one of those, you know, it's like those overnight sensations that take 20 years. Um, yeah, it's been building up a body of expertise of practitioners of tools, uh, you know, that are really allowing this this work to be digitized. So I look at it overall as digital biology. And of course, anything that gets digitized starts off slow, but gets faster, better, cheaper, pretty quickly. Um, you know, the mRNA vaccines, were, it wasn't just Moderna, it was BioNTech and others that had been working on this for years. Um, this was just a, an application that really had the urgency to, to really push it through into our, you know, the marketplace in our arms very quickly. But, you know, the real breakthrough there is that we went from manufacturing a vaccine in eggs or in, in, in the lab. Now your body becomes the manufacturing plant, so to speak. We're really just putting in the program, you know, to make spike protein, COVID spike protein in your body. Your body manufactures it and ultimately produces the immune reaction to it, which is how you get your, your immunological defense. That's a really important distinction. And, and if you don't mind, why don't you give us a little bit more color on that? Because I'm guessing that quite a few people don't really understand how the mnra uh, vaccines worked. Um, you know, I know in the past, for instance, like a flu vaccine, they'd have to develop those flu vaccines in like millions and millions of eggs, uh, chicken eggs, and then and then uh, and then extract the vaccine from that. That process takes a long time because you got to go through a biological cycle uh, to do that. So tell us about this new breakthrough with mnra. Yeah, well, M, the basically the the basic tenet of biology is DNA to RNA to protein. There are there are only three core systems in the living cell. One is replication, being able to duplicate DNA. Transcription is making a working copy of that DNA into a molecule that's very similar to DNA called RNA, and that RNA is used by a machine called the ribosome to actually make proteins. And this is this is standard in all living cells. So what, what mRNA vaccines do is you write the mRNA part, which is like the working copy. It's like the blueprint uh, molecule. You put it into a little lipid container. When you inject it into your arm, it goes in that lipid container, fuses with cells and delivers that mRNA program into the cell. And the ribosomes in your cell starts to manufacture that protein, in this case, the, the spike protein. And so it's really a wonderful way of quickly and temporarily programming your cells to make molecules, which is really fantastic. And synthetic biology is used to make that mRNA program. So the factory is literally the living cell inside of your body. Yep. In a way, isn't that kind of what a vaccine, what a virus does? Uh, it doesn't a virus kind of hijack a cell and then turn it into a factory to reproduce more, more of the virus? Exactly. You can think of a virus as, as a USB stick. Um, it's a nanoparticle like, like the, like the vaccines that were the mRNA vaccines. It's an, it's, except it's a natural nanoparticle and it does two things. It, it not only delivers a program, but it also delivers an uh, enough of a program to make more virus. So it becomes a self-manufacturing, a self-replicating uh, USB stick. The process on this, Andrew, I, I, you know, I think it's very important to make this distinction because there's been a lot of debate around the mRNA. I don't want to make this about the COVID vaccine in particular, but all, all you're talking about here is using the natural immune system computation platform or machinery, um, taking a message to produce this protein, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't affect uh, the DNA itself, right? No, not at all. In fact, because we're not working with DNA at all, um, we're just working with the messenger RNA, which is the working copy, kind of the blueprint. It, it delivers that working copy, the cell starts to make the protein, and that working copy just degrades and goes in the garbage, essentially. So it's only a temporary uh, reprogramming of the cell. So apart from, um, like in this instance, pro production of the spike protein to give you immunity to COVID, uh, what are some other applications that, that you could think of in terms of mRNA for some of the existing maladies that humanity is afflicted with? Oh, sure. Put me on the spot. Um, no, it, like basically, <laughs> basically anything that can be addressed through a biomolecule uh, is is within reach of this technology if you want it to be temporary. So with with a gene therapy, for example, you might want a permanent change because right. there's a metabolic disorder. But for example, if you just 
just need a, if you just need a protein based medicine for a short time, it could be something like insulin. mRNA is a potential way of delivering that program. Um, it could be that you just want to target cancer cells with a particular protein that knocks them out. So if you can build an, if you can build a, a structure that delivers that message just to a cancer cell, because half the problem with cancer is just targeting the right cells, then you can deliver an mRNA program to shut down that cancer cell. That's just a couple of examples. Very cool. Well, and it- and in fact, that's one of the things that you're working on personally, right? So with the, the humane genomics, uh, that that company is focused on on basically, I don't know how to describe this, but reprogramming vaccines, vaccine, uh, sorry, that virus. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> like reprogramming you. viruses, but basically it's like viruses for good. Uh, and that's a weird concept for most people. So can you tell us exactly how that would work? Yeah. So I, I got bitten by the synthetic biology bug before it was even called synthetic biology. And what I realized is what I'm actually fascinated by is genome engineering. I want to build genomes. And, and the smallest genomes to build are virus genomes. They're, they're really tiny compared to most cellular genomes. And so I started looking at very early on, what's the most useful thing I can do with a virus that isn't already being done? Um, and it turned out they make a really good potential treatment for cancer. There's a whole field of science called oncolytics, which is basically developing uh, cancer fighting materials. But there's a a branch of that called oncolytic virology, where you you basically piggyback on the fact that cancer cells are kind of broken and can't defend themselves from viral infections that well. And so I figured, well, with synthetic biology, which gives me the power to build a virus very precisely, because I can can build the entire genome from scratch, I could use that synthetic biology tool to make custom engineered viruses towards cancer. And and that was that was just my mission for a long time. And it turned into a, a startup called Humane Genomics, which is, uh, uh, I'm just an advisor to it now, but it's it continues to operate in New York. It's doing very well developing artificial viruses built from scratch that target cancer cells uh, in humans. And, you know, we were also, it's called Humane because we also figure that dogs will be an ab, you know, companion dogs. The dogs we have in our home are going to actually lead the way to a lot of this personalized medicine. Because if you're making uh. medicines for one person at a time, you 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 really want to get the process down, uh, you know, potentially not working on 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 people. <laughs> so we start um, we start working with dogs and chimps and things like that. That's, that's well, sounds I, th- I think dogs are actually the best example because they live with us. We treat them like our children. And I my feeling was always when our when our when the dogs in our homes get better cancer treatments than we can get at the hospital, right. then that'll that'll be kind of the the seed change in in the pharma industry around cancer. No, definitely. I think we need to talk about the ethics of this in the second part of the show. But um, no, so uh, CRISPR and Talon and these sort of gene uh, editing technologies have obviously made uh, um, significant leaps in in recent times. Um, but you know, um, in terms of the computing platforms and things that that you're using, how are they converging with uh, you know uh, gene editing in in particular? Well, gene editing tools like CRISPR also rely on the same synthetic biology tools to manufacture them and to program them. So, so it's all really one large digital tool set that's building. Um, the, the, the important thing about CRISPR technologies is if we need to make a change in a larger genome, that we can't synthesize from scratch or it's just not feasible to synthesize from scratch, CRISPR allows us to make a precise edit. So it's great for doing a, you know, many genetic therapies today that, that need a genetic treatment, that, um, uh, the, but it just isn't feasible to go and either write a whole virus or to go and reprogram the entire genome. So it's a really powerful tool that's making it into the clinic. But again, I think synthetic genomics, just being able to write genomes from scratch is going to give CRISPR a real run for the money, particularly in the research lab. And is that the sort of main mechanism you see moving forward for actual gene editing or gene therapy? Because it's, it's, 
you know, the the thing that we seem to be talking about with CRISPR right now is whether, you know, we can reliably do this at scale to, to make those permanent changes you talked about earlier. Well, the main problem with CRISPR has been the concern of off-target effects, because you're essentially editing a molecule in your in uh, as many cells as you want to affect that change. And sometimes these molecular editing systems will go and target the wrong piece of DNA in the cell. And if you target the wrong piece of DNA, then you have the potential, you, you might be trying to cure cancer, but you might actually be generating a cancer or another genetic error. So that's the main concern. But a lot of the work that they've been doing today has been making these uh, off-target effects less and less likely to happen through, through engineering. But ultimately, I just love the idea of having the precise editing control that we get with digital tools. I really love your analogy of like the video editing, like splicing the tape together and now we can do that digitally. It's a great analogy because obviously our accuracy and the ability for us to make convincing edits to the video videos in, in improved dramatically with computing um, advances. And that's a great analogy to think about in terms of the ac accuracy of, of gene therapy. All then we have to worry about is the systemic implications. Like what does flipping this gene or creating this protein do in terms of the, you know, the, the overall system, which we, we definitely want to get into. Uh, Andrew, uh, let, me, let me just take us to break quickly here after the break. Um, let's continue the conversation. You're listening to The Futurist with Brett King and Robert Turchek. We're interviewing Andrew Hessel, um, and we'll be right back after this break. Welcome to Breaking Banks, the number one global fintech radio show and podcast. I'm Brett King. And I'm Jason Henricks. Every week since 2013, we explore the personalities, startups, innovators, and industry players driving disruption in financial services. From incumbents to unicorns, and from cutting edge technology to the people using it to help create a more innovative, inclusive, and healthy financial future. I'm JP Nichols, and this is Breaking Banks. Welcome back to The Futurists. I'm Brett King. We are talking to Andrew Hessel, um, the author of, along with Amy Webb, The Genesis Machine, Our Quest to Rewrite Life in the Age of Synthetic Biology. So one of the, the subjects, Andrew, you tackle in the book is you know, how to not only how to engineer um, these uh, living organisms, um, you know, which we're talking about as synthetic biology, but... Um, you know, who who should be in charge of this and what should be the rule set and, um, you know, what are the risks uh, to this, uh, you know, just even enhancing human capabilities um, and, and things like this that are potential outcomes, you know, the, the ethical questions about humanity diverging either biologically or technologically from what a base human is, um, you know, how, how do you... How do you see us tackling that as a society uh, more broadly? Well, I, I think it's going to take uh, a lot more engagement than we have today with a broader group of individuals. Um, this is really a technology that promises to touch every one of our lives because it's life technology. So I think a part of it is the uh, just a recognition that the existing rules and regulatory systems that we put in place for the chemical pharma industry and then the biopharma industry and just bioagricultural systems. I think these all need to be revisited because this is completely different. It's like we're going from mainframe computers to, you know, to the personal computer, because this is really about making the technologies much more accessible. So this is going to this is going to need a, a, a reimagining of the, all the architectures to really allow it to run free. And then, you know, we, we, as for the ethics, I'm not a trained ethicist. What I love about ethics is it brings people to the table to discuss what they think is right and wrong. In general, I think that we, most people try and do good things with technology, but that's not universal. There's, if there is a way to do something, uh, if there's a way to do something, it's gonna happen, good and bad. Um, so I think that in general, 
Uh, most people try to do the right thing, but we need systems in place that can really find those those uh, those folks, those groups, those sometimes nation states that are doing things that that we consider just wrong. Um, and these need to be operating 24-7, 365. So to me, the next generation of biosecurity and even mm, needs to look a lot more like the cybersecurity systems we put in place right, as society right. digitized. Anti-biovirus uh, software that we run in now, uh, wetware stack. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think it's an important point. You make the analogy, Andrew, to computer programming, computer science, uh, where we're engineering biology in a way that's analogous. Um, and one of the things you pointed out is that there's we're now able to, to replicate that software engineering cycle. Um, by which I mean we can we can design, build, and test. Um, and I want you to talk a little bit about that because I think some of the people listening might have this scary idea in mind of like, oh, somebody developed something in a lab and then it runs amok and it gets loose and you know that that kind of sci-fi horror story that we've heard so many times. Um, but this test cycle is important for people to understand that that is possible. You know, in other words, you're not going to just freely release some kind of um, bio creature uh, into the wild. No, uh, in fact, getting this biotech in general is one of the most highly regulated industries in the world and trying to get anything out into the wild, at least as a company, is uh, is extremely difficult. Where, where there might be a growing concern, though, is as these tools become more accessible, uh, that people that aren't necessarily companies and bound by the conventions and and uh, and requirements of of a corporate structure might just start hacking the systems and doing things that just because you know they're being creative um i have become actually personally quite um, uh, supportive of the idea of really creating a large buffer space between the natural world of uh, all organisms, plants, animals, microbes, and the world that we can potentially engineer with synthetic biology. Most of the things that we build in, in the lab stay in controlled environments, bioreactors, again, a lab is a controlled environment. But the uh, uh, I'm... I, I would, if anything, like to see that get hardened in the future so that synthetic biology can really run free and be creative and explore in a safe sandbox. Uh, and we have and we increase the recognition that we need to um, protect and preserve the the natural world and the organisms there, because for 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 too long we've just we've just treated the natural world as as a human domain we think nothing of just plowing down a rainforest and and putting up you know palm oil plantations we so i think it's 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 two sides there we need we need to let the biology run free and keep it very open and transparent and share that information and at the same time we have to have greater respect for the natural world and and really think about when those two systems intersect uh, you know, one one area I, I'm sort of trying to think about in respect to this from a computing platform is um, is how we model the human system in terms of all of its complexities. It wasn't that long ago that we used to talk about all of the, these, uh, you know, um, genes that were junk junk DNA. Right, and now we're finding out. Well, it's not junk DNA. There's there's functions in there. When is it that you see that we will be able to accurately sort of model the way the human operating system works, and then be able to make you know um, like understand systemically how all of that works, and um, be more precise in understanding how tweaking one gene or producing one protein will affect the system. The short version is we have a lot more work to do um, because we still, you know, like many people have used uh, geospatial systems like Google Earth, which is, you know, really modeling one ball in space. And, and we keep layering on more and more information to make it incredibly useful, like GPS. We don't have that even for a single cell today. And then there are groups doing whole cell modeling, but you know, we are made of 50 trillion cells. So without having a whole cell model, even for a simple cell, it's really limiting our ability to do modeling on more complex systems like humans. We certainly have models of some of our, uh, of our immune system and our circulatory system and other systems, but they are by no means complete because we're not down to first principles. 
So let's just say it's early days in bioengineering, but we're, you know, anything that's digital starts to come together faster, better, cheaper. Yeah, a lot of quite a lot of this conversation so far has been about the application in the human body uh, and speculating about that. But as you point out, that might take some time. And there's certainly tons of regulatory uh, reasons why that process will go slow. And that's probably advisable. But quite a lot of the activity in synthetic biology has been on non-human organisms, microorganisms, um, things that we understand very, very well uh, because we can actually map the entire genome. They're smaller, they're easier to work with, they replicate faster and so forth. So these are non-human uses of the synthetic biology. And actually these non-human uses cover an awful lot of industry. And I think that's important for us to zoom out a little bit at this point. You know, when we talk about healthcare, healthcare represents about 20% of the U.S. economy. So it's big. It's a really, really big part of the uh, U.S. economy. And of course, there are many applications inside of healthcare um, for improving human health. And maybe synthetic biology will start to take a piece of that 20%. But let's bear in mind that many other industries are derived from natural resources. Uh, for instance, most of our energy is derived from natural processes or from biology from the past. And so there's a whole biological element to energy. The same is true with food, of course, food in all agriculture, but also things like apparel. We, st we don't really tend to think about the fact that, you know, the, the clothes that we wear and the, the shoes on our feet, they also tend to be derived from biology. And so there's a, a lot of other applications and these industries comprise together more than a third of the entire economy. And so you can start to see the vast dimensions uh, of, for the application of synthetic biology in manufacturing, uh, and in particular manufacturing substitutes. And those substitutes can be carbon friendly, uh, they can be located closer to the source uh, or to the place where it's gonna be distributed so they have a smaller carbon footprint. Sometimes they make things that are biodegradable in ways, so they can be like a substitute for plastic or something that we don't wanna create more of. Tell me a little bit more, Andrew, in your perspective about how that works. How do you harness something like an algae uh, or some other microorganism to produce, like actually to manufacture these synthetic products? Well, I think that you just gave a great overview, Robert, on really some of the potential for this because- Yay. No, but, it, but it's true. Like biology is what creates us, but it's what sustains us. Um, and so just, but when you really break it down, what we're really talking about here is using cells to make the uh, the stuff that we need for humanity to thrive. And, and the thing that I love about synthetic biology, particularly as we start going into full genome engineering, is now we have the tools to be able to program those cells with precision. So one of the first cells to be, to be made from scratch with synthetic biology, well, the first cell was done in 2010 by, by a scientist by the name of Craig Venter, but he used a cell called mycoplasma, which which is very, has a very small genome, but isn't really widely known. Jump ahead about a decade, and, and uh, a researcher by the name of, of, of Jason Chin synthesized the E. coli bacterium from scratch. It has a genome size of about 4 million bits, but E. coli uh, is, is one of the most studied organisms on the planet, and it's a really incredible manufacturer of different proteins, plus it has a generation time of 15 to 20 minutes. So it's very easy to grow you know, lots and lots of cells because it reproduces, uh, it makes bunnies look slow. You know? So <laughs> anyway, the, so, but having the ability there to reprogram the cell uh, even if it's a, a simple cell, gives us the ability to start manufacturing new materials, new proteins, uh, et cetera, et cetera, with high precision and to tune and optimize them for different purposes. The one thing about E. coli, though, is, it's, is it requires sugars to grow. Yeah. You know, if you move to a more complex cell, like an algae, it's, it, it can use sunlight as the energy source for manufacturing. And that's, and, and again, it can make thousands of different compounds as well. So learning to reprogram algae can radically change the way we start manufacturing many different things. And it's all powered by sunlight directly. Or another example, if you just one moment, is yeast. Yeast is already widely used. It's been used, harnessed by hum humans for 10,000 years. And, and a, an international team of scientists has been working to synthesize and boot up the yeast genome. And they're this close. The, the, well, that's impressive. What will happen if yeast is uh, synthesized and we can reprogram it? What can we do with that? 
Yeast is yeast uh, as a cell is a eukaryote, which means it's closer to our you and me than it is to bacteria. Um, so it's about a billion years more evolved than than the E. coli bacterium, um, and it's just an incredible manufacturing source. Now we use it today, you know, for you know for for <laughs> for for bread, bread making, beer, you know, but yeah. but yeah, for bread and beer are the common applications. But in industrial uses, it produces produces enzymes, it produces different proteins, it, it produces just a vast array of compounds. And as we can build and tune the yeast genome with precision, now we can direct you know, most of its energy into producing the, the, the compounds that we want. So we're going to see yeast become uh, pretty much a global manufacturing platform for, for biomaterials. It's important for people listening to understand that this is also about optimizing process and generating less waste, and in some cases, recycling waste. There's some speculation, well, for instance, that city waste is going to become more valuable because it'll right. start to be used as a raw material uh, that can be you know, kind of comp comp composted by these microorganisms. I think the other element of this that's interesting is we have some tools to, uh, you know, particularly in the current crisis with Ukraine, um, thinking about how we get off dependency on oil. And, you know, that's not just in terms of, um, you know, gas or petroleum to put in your vehicle, but more importantly, things like plastic production and things like that. Um, this is really where synthetic biology would seem to have huge application in helping us with sustainability as well. What, what are your thoughts on that, Andrew? I think biology is the only provable, sustainable technology. Uh, it, it it literally self-assembles from, from common elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, et cetera. Um, and it can be broken down. Anything made by biology can be broken down by biology, which is very important. It's only the, the some of the compounds and polymers that we've created chemically that the microbes haven't evolved to break down that are causing us problems. But there's a great example uh, of enzymes that were isolated from land landfills that could break down plastic bottles that have now been taken into the lab, studied and, and tuned and optimized. And now you can digest a plastic bottle uh, in a matter of days, which is absolutely incredible. So, so we, we, I, I believe that these technologies are absolutely going to help humanity thrive and be sustainable, but they come with some risks because as biology becomes easier to program, you get what you select for, you get what you train your AI systems for. And so for anything good that we imagine a new medicine, there's also the potential for something nefarious, which is why the entire architecture needs to be hardened in the same way that we had to harden computer networks. And uh, this would appear to you know, Lend, something that we've been talking about uh, increasingly when we have these conversations is global regulation. This is not really something you could regulate on a on a, a national basis because you could have a bad actor in another country that could, uh, you know, circumvent that. So um, is there a sort of a growing global regulatory movement around bioethics or around the synthetic biology? Not yet. Like right now, um, part of part of what I've been communicating is biosecurity needs to be put under national defense as a start and not just under health um, uh, or agricultural regulation. It needs to be part of, of national defense. And, and I think there's a good reason for that. Um, you know, we were essentially just invaded by, by a virus globally. Um, so a national defense is a start uh, which turns into better public health and just being able to defend ourselves against infectious disease. But we truly need an international body to come together on this because we all run the same operating system and microbes really don't care about human structures like borders or, you know, nations, et cetera, et cetera. So they yeah. just go where people go. <laughs> In respect to defense, uh, you know, the U.S. Defense Department has been on this for almost a decade. Uh, the, our uh, DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, introduced an office of biology as technology nearly a decade ago uh, for this very reason. You know, and, and DARPA's mission is to look at everything as a potential threat or as a potential way to protect people, uh, protect soldiers in particular. But then broadly, they disseminate that information into the into the mainstream. Uh, so I think that that's understood, but maybe not as widely as, as we might hope. 
Um, one of the things I'm trying to drive at here, though, is that there's also, for every downside effect, there's also tremendous potential for upside effects. You know, if you consider the last century, uh, one of the big themes of the 20th century was finding synthetic um, produced materials to replace uh, organic materials, things that were naturally produced. You know, for example, silk uh, was, was replaced um, by synthetic fabrics like nylon um, in the 1920s, 1940s, in that era. Uh, and typically those synthetics are derived from petroleum. But Andrew, is the point you just made, like humans are able to synthesize this stuff, but we don't do it in a way that nature can degrade uh, quite easily. And so we end up with a lot of garbage laying around. We're starting to accumulate huge amounts of plastic. Uh, so I'm excited about the idea that companies like Genomatica can take uh, sugar and start to generate their own version of nylon or some substitutes, substitute ingredients for nylon that are biodegradable as well. Uh, and there's also something happening like that with um, other kinds of polymers, like biosynthesized chitin, which is another element that can be used to replace plastics. Um, because we're starting to accumulate a lot of plastic in, you know, in landfill, but also in the ocean. What's the prospect for you know, some sort of um, synthetic uh, organism that can devour ocean-going plastic? Is that, yeah, is that a pipe a dream problem. or is that a possibility? I, I I think because it's in the ocean, which is uh, a, a natural environment, I don't think people would be generally supportive of filling it with engineered organisms. Um, <laughs> you might be able to build a processing plant, but I think really part of what we have to do is just stop polluting. Um, so a big a big part of that is just learning how to think. In, in completely new ways around sustainability. And, and it's, it's essentially mass accounting. The, the reason why a plastic bottle is used um, is because it's just so cheap because we don't do full ownership of, of the process you know, in a closed loop. So th what, what I find really inspiring today is that you know, we've got a new space race going um, because we're finally getting the cheap delivery to orbit by more and more companies, which is which means that you have to start thinking in closed systems because space is a space station, for example, is truly a closed system. You have to account for everything going in and out. So I think that the opening up of space is really going to drive the development of new sustainability technologies that we can apply on Earth that can really resolve a lot of the waste issues that we have today if we can start to deploy them at scale. Amazing. Well, this has been all a right. fun conversation and we could go on yes. all day long. Uh, yeah, we didn't Brett even I... get into transgenics. I wanted to get into that, but next time, Andrew. We'll have to have you back for that. There's a lot more to say. Andrew Hessel, you're a wealth of information. So much interesting stuff to share with us about synthetic biology. And your new book, The Genesis Machine, which we both read and have enjoyed, we recommend to our audience. Uh, Andrew, if folks listening to this want to find out more, what's the best place for them to reach out to you or to read about your work? Well, you know, the first, I mean, buy the book. It, it, it really contains a lot of information and ideas and scenarios. And it's it's a book about science, but it, it's it's not for the scientists. It's really meant so that anyone can pick it up and read it. And, yeah, that's and one of the advantages of working with Amy Webb. She writes in a way that makes it easy to understand, accessible. It's the easy pathway to mastering the information of synthetic biology. And the next step after that is Amy Webb runs something called The Future Today in Institute, where she puts out future trend reports. She just uh, just launched this, uh, uh, the 2022 reports at South by Southwest just a few days ago. If you go to her website, all of those reports are open source and freely available. So, And she's got a synthetic biology report that's amazing. If you're younger and you're interested in doing this as, as, some, as a profession, um, I point people to iGEM, the International Genetically Engineered Machines Organization that has really become the premier um, point for, for young entrepreneurs and students to learn about this technology. And if you're older and thinking of a career switch and you're doing anything digital today, there is a place for you in the emerging synthetic biology industry, which is growing incredibly fast, and yet it's it's still early days. Um, I this has the potential to to be an industry that grows faster than 
even the computing industry, because for the computing industry to advance, you know, Moore's law being the famous, you know, pace of, of, the, of the computing industry, you have to go and build new technologies, you have to build new fabs, you have to design new chips. With cells, they're just waiting for us to write new programs. So it really has the potential to advance at the speed of software. So, so keep an eye on, That's amazing. you know, yeah. So it, 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 we, we don't know the limits of the cell because it's a universal machine, but it will be our ability to write genetic software that ultimately dictates the pace of creation. So I think we're on the cusp of a Cambrian explosion of organisms this century that is like unprecedented. Amazing. Uh, you know, you think of all the applications, uh, you know, uh, de-extinction and all of those things. It just it blows my mind. Andrew Hassel, thank you for joining us on The Futurists. If you're listening uh, to the show, uh, be aware we are a, a new podcast. Uh, you know, we're a few episodes in now, but please uh, make sure to tell your friends about the podcast. Give us a five-star rating on iTunes. That's how people can find out about the podcast as well. And mention us on social media. We'd really appreciate that. But we will be back with you you next week and we will see you in the future future. well that's it for the futurists this week if you like the show we sure hope you did please subscribe and share it with the people in your community and don't forget to leave us a five-star review that really helps other people find the show and you can ping us anytime on instagram and twitter at at futurist podcast for the folks that you'd like to see on the show or the questions that you'd like us to ask Thanks for joining. And as always, we'll see you in the future.